Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Timing in Mission Critical Systems, brought to you by GPS World Magazine and our sponsor, MicroSemi. I'm Joelle Harms from North Coast Media, Senior Digital Editor for GPS World, and I'll be your event manager. Before we get started, I want to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode. A recording of this webinar will be posted to gpsworld.com slash webinars and will be emailed to you tomorrow. At this time, I'd like to acquaint you and with the ways you can participate during today's presentation. Please notice the Submit button in the lower left-hand corner of your console. If you have a question, type it in the box at the bottom left and click Submit to place your question in queue. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. We will address these questions at the end of the presentation during the Q&A portion. If you experience any technical difficulties during today's, today's event, you may select Help using the yellow question mark button for a page of frequently asked questions, or you can use that same Q&A box to submit your issue. And assistant producer, Allison Barwatch, or I will personally assist you. Our Twitter feed is placed on the right side of your screen. You also may uh, enter into discussion with the attendees uh, using the hashtag GPSWorldWebinar. Um, you can learn more about our speakers by viewing their photo, bio, email, uh, Twitter handles, etc. in the upper left-hand corner of your console. And if you're logged into any of your social media accounts, you can share the webinar's title, description, and URL with any of your friends or colleagues on popular, popular social media sites, all within the Share This widget. Now I'd like to turn today's event over to our moderator, GPS World and Geospatial Solutions Group Editor-in-Chief, Alan Cameron. Thanks, Joelle. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you around the world who are joining us today for Timing in Mission Critical Systems, brought to you by Microsemi Corporation. Timing and synchronization, as you know, play a critical role in day-to-day -day functions from the civil sphere to the defense security sphere. And our speakers today are going to take us through some of the ramifications of the ever-changing technology, the need to keep up, the need to get ahead of the curve, actually, with next-generation timing uh, technologies. We're going to hear from three speakers. Paul Skoog from Microsemi will open the presentation. Uh, he will talk a little bit about those next-generation timing technologies and provide a framework for the discussion. He'll then introduce Scott Williams, from GL Williams Associates, who will talk about mission-critical timing applications. And finally, we'll hear from Jim Wright of uh, Range Generation Next, talking about government test range timing. The final quarter of the hour, more or less, will be devoted to your questions and their answers. Thank you again for joining us. We'll turn over now to Paul Skoog. Paul, take it away. Great. Thank you, Alan. And uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for your time and attention today. Uh, I think we have an excellent lineup of applications, topics, and technologies that we're going to be presenting to you, uh, including some never-before-seen uh, timing performance data that I think uh, you'll be interested in seeing as well. Uh, the goal here in uh, this webinar is that you're going to learn something uh, useful about timing in your particular application area. Uh, and in the event uh, that you're not familiar with MicroSemi, if we can go to the next slide, please. MicroSemi is a global provider of synchronizations and semiconductor solutions. We build products all the way from small timing chips up to full rack mount uh, timescale systems that countries use to synchronize their entire timing infrastructure. And uh, speaking of timing infrastructure, 93% uh, of the uh, UTC World Time contributions are from MicroSemi products, in particular the, the cesiums and the hydrogen masers that we use to keep very, very accurate time. Uh, our products go into a variety of areas of commercial communications and network synchronization, uh, a lot of IEEE 1588 technologies deployed, and we have tens of thousands of NTP network time servers sold as well. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Essentially, time enables all infrastructures. We get timing and data centers for log file accuracy to 
time stamping uh, transactions for stock exchange, financial exchanges, types of things, up to synchronizing synchrophasers and power grid communications, all the way down to synchronizing sensors on the bottom of the ocean in seismic exploration, for example. The focus and interest of this webinar, though, is to focus on mission-critical systems, right? Uh, it's one thing to keep the time correct on your phone, for example, right? That could be mission-critical in some cases, but generally speaking, though, uh, maintaining a proper time and frequency on systems that are essential for critical business operations or national defense programs and systems or even safety systems, for that matter, those, those are viewing as a bit more critical. Thus, we'd like to start the webinar by presenting uh, a selection of mission critical applications uh, and the role of timing in those applications and that where, is where uh, Scott and Jim are going to be illuminating a lot of interesting application areas for us. And then I'm going to come back in and I'm going to follow up uh, with a presentation on some of the new technologies uh, that support those particular requirements. And like I said, there's even some interesting data in there that uh, goes, to, goes along to, to support that. So. With that, if we can go to the next slide, and I'll hand it back to you, Alan. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Scott Williams from GL Williams Associates is going to talk about mission critical timing applications. Scott? Oh, thanks. Hello, um, my name is Scott Williams. Um, I've been representing micro semi frequency and time division for over 20 years. I have a master's degree in electrical and computer engineering. And before I became a sales rep, I was a systems design engineer working in the U.S. government mill defense sector. I was actually a microsemi timing customer myself. My, my job now is to meet and talk with our customers and help them architect uh, timing and frequency solutions for their systems. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Our Typical customers and applications include military communication systems. We do government labs, government agencies. We do timing for air traffic control, synchronized IT departments. We work with many different uh, prime contractors for the U.S. military. We also do mission-critical timing systems for telecom wireless and wireline customers in both the commercial and uh, government sectors. I have uh, four examples of some typical timing challenges that I see. And later in this webinar, Paul Scob will introduce you to a, a new product that would certainly fit the bill for any of these requirements. Uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, the first example is, here is a shipboard tactical timing subsystem. Here we have a Navy ship with an existing onboard integrated master clock. Uh, our customer, in this case, is responsible for integrating an onboard communication system. So the ship's master clock generates a pair of timing reference signals that are distributed for use by various subsystems. And these can include radar, sonar, co communications, weapons, engine controls, etc. So we can't have these different systems on the ship each having their own time. Everybody's got to be on the same time and from the same source. So on the diagram, uh, you can see the signals labeled primary IRIG-B, and there's also a secondary IRIG-B. So IRIG is a very common way of distributing time of day over a coaxial cable. Uh, even though we see packet-based networks all over shipboard systems these days, many ships still use IRIG-B to distribute time because it's proven uh, very reliable. Um, the customer system takes in both IRIG reference signals uh, signal, and which is the ship's time, and locks its own internal oscillator uh, to them and outputs signals to drive the, the downstream, uh, downstream communications gear. So the 10 megahertz sine waves uh, that you see in the diagram, they're required by the satellite modems uh, because they need a very stable reference frequency. And basically, the more stable the reference frequency is, the higher data rates this communication system can achieve. So uh, they use IRIG-B also themselves to feed their own downstream gear and also network time protocol, or NTP, which drives their internal network devices. The system is either running on the primary IRIG uh, or the secondary IRIG, or if for some reason the ship's time were to go down and there's no reference, you know, either way, this system is, is very critical and needs to keep generating time, timing signals to maintain uh, critical communications. So if all else fails, 
in this case, the system requirement here is to maintain time to better than a microsecond or one millionth of a second from the ship time over a 24-hour period. Uh, and we help our customers choose the right type of holdover oscillators to meet their requirements. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here's an example of a military combat simulator. So this customer came to us with four geographically separated simulation sites that need to be syn uh, synchronized together. But they're separated by hundreds or thousands of miles. It's a big simulation. Everybody's got to be on the same time. And once it starts rolling, it can't stop, even if they lose communication with each other. So each site drives up to 12 downstream devices. And this customer has special emitters and sensors and data acquisition equipment that's part of the simulation. So by using GPS as an avenue to get a common time, each site can be synchronized to GPS independently to within literally tens of nanoseconds or billionths of a second to each other. In this case, our customer uh, did have a, a VPN to tie the sites together, but the routers and switches that were in between, in this case, inhibited them from using the network for the tight synchronization that they required for the simulation. So if any site loses GPS, an atomic oscillator, in this case a rubidium, is used to hold time and keep the downstream devices going. If GPS goes away, uh, the simulation keeps going. Uh, next slide. Okay, here we have a corporate IT department with four data centers. There's two in the United States and two in Europe. They've got about 50,000 Windows-based client computers. They want everybody to be synchronized together using NTP or network time protocol to maintain their log file accuracy and also for traceability and auditing purposes. If something goes wrong, uh, it's key that these IT departments, they have accurate log files with accurate timestamps uh, to help them unravel what happened. Uh, Microsemi has comprehensive uh, time client and server and management software. It's called Domain Time 2 for precise synchronization across the network. This customer needs uh, needed four NTP servers. There's one at each data center, and each serving as a peer or backup to each other. We call this NTP peering. So if GPS were to go away, maybe an antenna would get struck by lightning or an unplugged cable, uh, the, the uh, timing just keeps, keeps going. The, this customer also wants to use authentication. Um, all 50,000 clients need to be able to authenticate the NTP servers to make sure they're all getting their timing from a reliable source and not a nefarious time source pretending to be the real NTP server. Here we use a set of agreed-upon crypto keys. We call this MD5 symmetric key authentication between the time servers uh, and the clients, and these encrypted key hashes are encoded within the timestamps. So if GPS goes away, um, they also require that uh, the entire network could stay in sync within a millisecond over 24 hours. Again, we help pick the holdover oscillator required to achieve that. Uh, next slide. So this is my last slide. Um, this is an example of a high-frequency stock trading firm. It could be an investment bank, a hedge fund, or a firm specializing in electronic trading. Uh, these, uh, an HFT firm typically would have a cage within a data center, a very large data center, housing racks of hundreds of trading servers. Uh, and uh, there could also be hundreds of firms within the same data center, each with their own cage. Uh, these data centers are generally right next to a major stock exchange. For example, the New York Stock Exchange Data Center is in New Jersey. So each, each of these servers now can trade thousands of stock trades per second and require very accurate time stamping down to single-digit microsecond or even sub-microsecond. You know, these are millionths of a second. So they may only hold on to a stock or a position for a few hundred microseconds or less, and then they sell it. So one interesting fact is the world's record now for a round-trip uh, travel time from uh, Chicago to New Jersey and back is about 13 milliseconds or 13 one-thousandths of a second. So think about this. If there's a guy in New Jersey that's uh, next in this data center and he holds on to a stock position for 
let's say, 100 microseconds, he could do 130 trades by the time the guy in Chicago makes his 13 millisecond round trip. So for this type of customer, uh, accurate and reliable timing is, is key. So, um, you know, they want to use, in this case, an antenna on a roof and share it between two of these servers. It's about 500 feet generally from the top of the roof down to the trading cage. Um, and they're willing to, the, these, many times it's more expensive to run the cable and rent the space on the roof for the antenna than it is to buy our equipment. Because all these, all these traders, they want to be right next to the stock exchange and they're willing to, to pay the price to do that. So these HFT firms use what we call precision time protocol, or IEEE 1588, for the timing uh, for, for these trading servers, and they run PTP time client software. And um, these guys also use a pulse per second to drive their network uh, sniffers or latency monitoring probes, and NTP for timing their other network peripherals. So if GPS goes away, it's, it's key that the, their trading servers keep absolute time and so all these guys are using, you know, at a minimum, rubidium oscillators for holdover during the trading day. So these are just four examples of mission-critical timing requirements that you know, we see from our customer base. And thanks for listening. Thank you. And now we'll turn to Jim Wright from uh, RG Next, who's going to talk about government test range timing, uh, test range operations, and test uh, testing timing requirements. Jim, please go ahead. We may be experiencing some audio difficulty on the line. We'll work with that and get right back with you shortly. Uh, is this better? There. Now we can hear you, Jim. Thank you. Oh, I apologize. Uh, my name is Jim Wright. I'm uh, responsible for testing, uh, timing and sequencing on the Eastern Range and Western Range. Eastern Range is Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Um, and we have tracking stations down at uh, Jupiter, Florida, and Ascension Island in the South Atlantic. We also launch from the Western Range at Vandenberg Air Force Base, and we have a tracking station at Pillar Point, California, about uh, 300 miles north of, San, uh, of Vandenberg near San Francisco. Uh, we launch, test, and track DOD missiles and space uh, craft. Um, we have multiple tracking stations. Each of them has a uh, range safety component, telemetry, radar, communications, optics, uh, weather, and timing and sequencing. Uh, next slide, please. So our big deal is time transfer. We have requirements on, the, on both ranges that vary from one microsecond, I'm sorry, one millisecond to a half of a microsecond relative to the DOD master clock, which is in Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C. GPS is our most prominent time transfer method. Uh, we also use uh, two-way satellite time transfer, portable clocks, and even use cesiums as holdover devices. So time transfer within the ranges, sometimes we use just GPS receivers in standalone facilities, and we don't transfer the time to any other instrumentation. Other times we transfer time via IRIG A or IRIG B to remote synchronized time code generators, which then generate uh, serial time codes. Um, we also use NTP, Network Time Protocol, and Precise Protocol. Uh, that's uh, IEEE 1588. The other uh, PTP ser PTTI service, Precise Time and Time Interval Services, include uh, 100 kilohertz, uh, 1 megahertz, 5 megahertz, and 10 megahertz. Uh, those have to be precise uh, 
qualities. Uh, we heard about that in the previous presentation. Uh, we also output decade repetition rates, 1 PPS, 10 PPS, all the way up to 100 K PPS, and clock communication r rates, uh, 75 bits per second, all the way up to T1 and E1 uh, rep rates. And then the other part of our job here is we do countdown systems or sequencing systems to provide precision uh, countdown and count up for the precise uh, tracking of vehicles that we need to do. So one of the big things is we not only have to do all this precise time and frequency distribution, but we also have to have real-time knowledge of the health status and time accuracy of all of our systems. So I was also asked, what do I see for the future for the ranges as far as time? And I think we're going to evolve away from these serial time codes like IRIG A and IRIG B and go almost exclusively to network time protocol and precise time protocol. Um, that, that requires less infrastructure, less point-to-point -point, uh, uh, circuits, and also obviously less equipment. So um, we also need to know uh, what the health and status of our timing systems are, not only how well they're working, but what is the time accuracy that they're providing to systems. So we're going to need more robust timing systems uh, that are not solely dependent on um, GPS uh, because we know the GPS is a military system, and as a military system, it can potentially be disabled by an enemy, or we ourselves uh, might disable it because the enemy is using it. Uh, and then GPS itself is subject to some system failures, jamming and spoofing and other things. So we're going to need some redundant uh, timing systems. And some of the ones that are in practice now are two-way satellite time transfer, uh, frequency standard-based uh, flywheels. Um, there's eLoran, which is an offshoot of Loran that was in the 1980s and 1990s. And there may be others. Um, and that's all I got. So, Alan, back to you. Thanks very much, Jim. We're going to turn now uh, back to Paul. Paul Skoog is going to talk about next generation timing technologies. Paul? Great. Thanks, Alan. And also thank you, Scott and uh, uh, Jim, for giving us some insights there into some specific applications and some tougher requirements, particularly now and even going forward. So what I'm going to like to do here in the, the section coming up is I'm going to be talking about some new technologies that support these applications and requirements. So if we can just jump right in and go to the next slide. How I'd like to frame this up, actually, is sort of summarizing what we heard. Um, you kind of look on the right. There's, uh, you know, critical signals. We, we heard about the need for iRig and 10 megahertz, a variety of pulses, NTP, and so forth. And where we're currently deriving that from is from time references. Uh, GPS, certainly cesium backups in the case of some of the military systems. Uh, GNSS at large, IRIG inputs, and what sort of sits in the middle, I'm calling time server technology, right? Something that can translate those precise time references into the critical signals. And I thought just a, from an organizational standpoint of talking about these technologies, I, I break it down into clock accuracy, timing signals, and then network timing because, you know, the, the timing signals are migrating in the direction of network timing. So that's how I'm going to frame up the conversation. If we can go to the next slide, please. How I'd like to do that is put it in the context of a new next generation clock for MicroSemi. Now, this is, this is not meant to be a walkthrough of product features or that sort of thing, but rather, you know, the intent is to use the product as a visual stepping stone uh, to discuss the key points of the accuracy and timing signals and network base. So, with that, what we're looking at here is the, is the new Sync Server S600 and S650 uh, products. Uh, we're going to be talking more about some of the technology that resides inside the S650. You can see there it, is, uh, it has multiple network ports for network timing. Uh, that's one of the technologies we'll talk about. We'll also be talking about uh, some of the timing coming off those BNC connectors. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Let's start first by just covering um, the clock accuracy. Uh, we heard requirements down to sub-microseconds. What we see here, you know, is uh, that uh, both the accuracy and the holdover were both important. This particular product is less than 15 nanoseconds RMS to UTC. 
And to Jim's point, uh, that's while tracking GPS, so that's UTC, USNO, uh, via the GPS satellite system. Uh, holdover was mentioned frequently because in the event GPS uh, becomes unavailable for whatever reason and the clock has to maintain accuracy. For example, in the combat simulation systems, I thought that was particularly interesting, actually, uh, because, you know, a communication system can go down, but, you know, you still need to be able to move forward. So holding over precise time in your domain becomes very important. Uh, and, you know, a rubidium atomic oscillator can do that for you, you know, less than three microseconds drift at three days. But one of the new technologies I wanted to talk about, since this is a technology conversation, has to do, uh, in effect, with the uh, how temperature affects an oscillator. As temperature changes, the oscillator speed can change as well. And if the oscillator is speeding up and slowing down, that means your time is speeding up and slowing down. So there's some new technology here uh, that's been embodied in the S650. We call it active thermal compensation technology. Uh, no, that's not just a fan. It's a lot more than a fan, actually. It has to do with a lot of multiple temperature sensors that are inside the chassis and on the PCB boards and so forth, so we can get a very accurate idea of the temperature environment inside. Uh, we have multiple variable speed fans that allow us to control airflow through, as well as redundancy. There's some thermal isolation techniques and some clock modeling, math and science, and controls going on in there. give you a little idea on how well it works, the graph down there on the lower right essentially shows clock offset error relative to time. And what we did is we changed the uh, temperature. And you can see there with the red uh, line, says uh, standard oscillator with the thermal compensation off. You can see as, you know, as we change the temperature, you can see how the, the time of the device actually changed. But when we turn the uh, thermal compensation technology on, you get an idea there that the, uh, the standard oscillator performs just as well as the OCXO because we're able to very accurately model what's happening thermally inside the device and compensate for that. Uh, additionally, we, we talked about the advent of perhaps if GPS for some reason became unavailable. We also talked about uh, alternative uh, GNSS constellations like LONAS and Beta and stuff like that that are available. So with that, let's go to the next slide. I'm going to switch gears here. We're going to start talking a little bit about uh, the timing signals. Uh, this is the backside of an S650. It's modular. There's a couple of bays. If you look down there at the bottom unit, the bottom chassis, uh, there's some timing I.O. modules there that have been plugged into it. I want to talk about those timing I.O. modules in particular. So if we go to the next slide, please, we can now look at, here's the uh, a timing I.O. module. Uh, it has uh, two input B and C's and six outputs. Uh, the inputs, of course, are important. There is an example that uh, I believe Scott used for shipboard where your time source is an inbound IRIG B, right? It doesn't have to be uh, GPS. It can be another time code. That's what the input uh, BNCs are for. There's also some output BNCs to produce other signals that are needed on the range and in some of the other applications that we saw. And so the timing eye on this is the timing eye is fixed, but there's a new technology in there called Flexport technology that I wanted to share with you. It's very innovative. It's very new. Nothing else, uh, never before seen quite like it. This is software enabled. So if we can go to the next slide, please. I wanted to put the, uh, the conversation about the technology sort of against the backdrop of existing technology, um, sort of what uh, legacy systems that you find in the marketplace today, including some of the older systems from Micro Semi. In effect, internally in these devices, there's a backplane. And if you want time codes, uh, you plug in a piece of hardware that outputs time codes. Okay, I mean, we call it a multi-code TARD kind of thing. Uh, if you want sine waves, well, we have, uh, it, you, you buy a piece of hardware, you plug it in, and you get sine waves. And you, you get the idea. If you want a particular class of signal, you have to install dedicated hardware with fixed to BNCs that output those fixed signals. Well, uh, we ratchet forward to, you know, today, and we have some new technology that we call the Flexport technology. It's flexible signal generation hardware. And the, the big idea on this is really pretty simple, and that's any signal, any port, uh, any BNC connector you want, you can select whether it's a time code or a rate and so forth. So if we go to the next slide and kind of zero in on this Flexport technology, uh, it's pretty well represented there by uh, you know, the flexibility you get when you look at the BNC there on the left. Uh, you can get anything you want out of that uh, in terms of the supported AM or DCLS time codes, sine waves, programmable rates, you know, uh, 
Uh, Jim talked in his presentation on a range. They need a wide range of programmable rates and decade rates. Those would be the fixed rates coming out. Uh, and this is on each individual connector. You can select through the user interface uh, exactly what signal you want coming out, which connector. And it's important to note that we've paid a lot of attention to make sure that those signals are coherent, uh, where it makes sense to have the signals coherent. For example, a 10 mega PPS and a 1 PPS uh, need to be coherent in their on-time marks. And so this adds a lot of flexibility uh, on a port-by-port -port basis. But at the same time, we also saw some applications where uh, there were a number of the same outputs that were needed, like, for example, a number of uh, BNCs that had to output 1 PPS. So you could choose to output all the same signals there, uh, uh, not a real detailed mix, uh, and avoid the use of having to add more hardware to distribute, for example, a 1 PPS signal. So it, it, it works both ways. It gives you a high flexibility if you need a, uh, a lot of diverse signals, but at the same time it helps you in fanning out the same signal. So if we step back and go to the next slide, please. Essentially, we're looking at the back side and the standard configuration of a timing I.O. module. And of course, you can put two timing I.O. modules in the chassis. Uh, and you get some fixed outputs. And those fixed outputs in the standard configuration, those are the most common. All right, and we're aware of that. But we also know that oftentimes you need a greater flexibility, greater fan out, whatever the case may be. And so with the Flexport option, you can see that all six of the blue outputs can be any signal you want. And at the same time, you can handle a variety of inputs on the green. So the whole idea on that, the technology is, you know, the flexibility and the accuracy uh, of, of meeting whatever diverse need is, uh, exists in that particular application. So um, let's move on now to the next slide, and let's talk about network timing, okay? In this case, uh, uh, the unit has four uh, independent gigabit Ethernet LAN ports, okay? So it's multi-port. Multi-port's not uh, uncommon these days, but what is uncommon and very unique is that all of these ports are equipped with hardware time stamping. So you can imagine as we begin to migrate from traditional timing signals of like IREG B, the serial time codes, more towards network-based timing, you're definitely going to want, you know, ports that support hardware time stamping. Now, in the S650, I wanted to highlight two types of NTP technology in particular because these are better than normal and then the best possible normal in terms of NTP. So if we look at the middle column here, that's going to be the standard NTP uh, that's in the unit. We use the NTP daemon, the open source NTP daemon. We, of course, have our own ref clock driver, which is a, a common thing uh, in commercial time servers. However, the big difference is instead of being purely software-based NTP D operations like most time servers, in this case, we have hardware assist. And that gives us a very nice accuracy there, five microseconds. But the key thing that helps is it makes it so that we can hold that accuracy under load independence. We can get up to 10,000 NTP requests per second. And depending on the load, whether it's a sustained load or a burst load perhaps, we can still maintain that time accuracy. I also want to introduce a new concept here, uh, and it's where technology uh, merges with security. And that is most clocks these days that have a network port on them uh, to be attached to the network in addition to doing the timing output, because it has a network port, the IT security department will most likely get involved. And they're going to want to know how security hardened the device is and so forth. And of course, the product has all kinds of security aspects to it. But when it comes to the actual NTP operations and so forth, we do put in some overall packet limiting. But we take it a lot further than that when we look at here at the right column and we look at the NTP reflector. And in that case, it's 100% hardware-based NTP. And this gives us very accurate time stamping uh, down to around, you know, 15 nanoseconds RMS. It's very load independent. And one of the remarkable things is it can, it can actually do 120,000 NTP requests per second, uh, which is basically, you know, one gigabit uh, line speed. Now, 120,000 NTP requests per second is sort of akin to saying you're going to put in a 100,000 horsepower engine in your car. Uh, you really don't need that much. That's pretty much overkill. It sort of comes for free just because we're doing it uh, in hardware at line speed. But it gives us other benefits aside from, you know, the accuracy and reliability of servicing NTP requests for time, and that it comes in the security aspects. Uh, 
port-by-port -port packet limiting, denial of service detection, and alarming, and so forth. So I'll go into a little more detail on those, but I thought I'd show you, the, peel it back, and show you some of the underlying technology here. So if we go to the next slide, in this case, we're looking at the standard NTP um, time stamping operations in the product that's leveraging hardware time stamping. And if you're familiar at all with how NTP works, it's frankly a packet is initiated, such as step one there, the client initiates a, a request to the server, it's sent off, it's received at the server, uh, the server puts a couple time stamps on it and sends it back to the client. Well, if we kind of break this down a little bit, you can begin to see where the advantages of a hardware clock and hardware time stamping really help. And so if we start at step number one, uh, you know, an NTP packet arrives at the server, and the very first thing that happens is we put a timestamp on that packet, and that packet is the T2 timestamp. That's the receive timestamp, and when the packet was exactly received, and so we know exactly when it was received at the network interface. And then step two, the packet is sent to the daemon, all right? Now, it has to go from the hardware clock up to the daemon, and what happens there, it has to transit the operating system stack, and that can introduce delay, and that's sort of the the downside to regular software-based NTPD operations, and that is, you know, transiting up and down the operating system stack introduces asymmetric delays, which degrades the overall accuracy of the clock, and uh, especially when it's under load. And so this architecture right here and a patent and technique that I'll walk you through in terms of a technology standpoint really mitigates those internal asymmetric delays. Because what happens is if we go to step number three, uh, now the uh, NTP daemon wants to send the packet back to the client. It needs the T3, which is the transmit timestamp, so it requests it from the hardware clock, and so there's a couple transits of the uh, operating system stack there. Combines the T2 and T3 timestamps in the packet, sends the packet back out, and you can see it departs there at step number five. Well, we have a patent and some technology here that what we actually do is we mirror back there in step number six, we mirror the packet back to the ref clock driver and we compare when it actually left based on you know the last little bit of hardware that touched it before we put it on the wire to the T3 timestamp. And we're able to servo this and uh, compensate for internal asymmetric delays and adjust the T3 timestamp for the internal delays that are being seen in real time. So as the load varies and fluctuates, we can compensate that with this servo, adjusting the T3 timestamp, so the overall accuracy of the product is improved. So an interesting underlying technology that combines some, some uh, interesting patented feedback loop along with using a hardware uh, for timestamping. So if we take this a step further and go to the next slide, please, we can now are going to be looking at the NTP reflector technology. So in this case, you know, we're, we're basically talking about ultra-accurate line speed NTP operations. These inbound NTP packets, they come in off the wire, they go directly into the hardware, the FPGA. Um, we examine the packets. If it's an NTP packet, we put the timestamps on it, we send it back out, and this is done at line speed. And this is basically where the 120,000 packets per second come in, right? Now, we're identifying and looking at every single packet that comes in and doing this timestamping. For non-NTP traffic that comes in, uh, we essentially drop most of it, right? We want to protect the CPU from any potential nefarious activity, uh, denial of service type things. So what we allow is the user to define what the packet throughput should be for non-NTP type traffic. And you know, that might be pings or you know, some other general things, but also you want to block out any kind of denial of service type activity. And so what we do is we monitor the packet uh, loads for non-NTP traffic and drop whatever exceeds the thresholds. If you reach the user set threshold, we'll alarm, you know, send an SNMP trap or whatever. On the NTP, we service all NTP requests, but if the threshold is above a user set level, uh, we'll alarm and let you know, hey, there's more NTP traffic on this port than you expected. Perhaps something's happening more than you expected, or maybe there's some kind of denial of service uh, happening. And the reason why we pay so much attention to denial of service is because NTP is UDP IP protocol. It's connectionless. So it's real easy to just blast a, a time server with a zillion packets. We can handle those packets, but the problem is legitimate clients might not be uh, able to access the time just because of the, the, 
uh, the line being consumed with a bunch of you know, unnecessary traffic. So that's the idea there. So I promised you some data. If we go to the next slide, let me show you how well this works. <clears throat> so what we're looking at here on the graph on the left, okay, is essentially uh, we looking at the standard NTP operations inside the unit with the assisted hardware time stamping. We're looking at a scale from minus 100 to plus 100 microseconds. And going across on the x-axis is color-coded information that corresponds to the legend in terms of the loading. And we start from 64 NTP packets per second all the way up. In this case, the blue there is 10,000 NTP packets per second. And you can see that we have some very consistent uh, behavior. It's all within the time accuracy specification. Uh, up to 10,000 packets a second, it maintains that accuracy. Now, you may not realize it, but that's actually fairly phenomenal data because normally in a typical time server that doesn't have the hardware assist technology, you basically see as the load goes up, so do the outliers, the dot packets, uh, and, and your accuracy degrades as the load goes up. It's just the nature of uh, a pure software NTP uh, implementation. In our case, that's not the case. You see a few outliers. That happens to be just related to the servo wing of, the, of adjusting, precisely adjusting that T3 timestamp. So the next question is, well, how well does the reflector work? And if we look there then, um, at that little red line to the right and zoom in on that, we can see on the graph there on the right, we're now looking at uh, plus or minus one microsecond. So we've zoomed in 100 times, and that thin line you see there uh, represents the same load levels all the way up, in this case, to 30,000 NTP packets uh, per second. And there's no drop packets. There's no outliers. We're actually time stamping those packets there around 15 nanoseconds RMS. Completely load independent, uh, that flight line continues all the way out to 120,000 NTP requests per second. So it's basically very accurate, the reflector, uh, handles all of the load uh, seamlessly, and it provides, uh, you know, the security for mission-critical operations that, that, that we talked about. So next slide, please. With that, uh, I just kind of want to talk about some key takeaways here. I'd, I'd like to circle back. Uh, tie off some technologies to the application requirements that were discussed by Con uh, Scott and Jim. So if we can go to the next slide, please. And this essentially is the, the session key points, right? Up top, we saw some government, military, aero, enterprise, trading applications with exacting and diverse timing requirements. You know, Scott covered some themes that uh, had to do with accuracy and, and the need for upgraded oscillators for holdover in the event the GPS signal was not available, right? He also covered a variety and a quantity, uh, quality, if you will, of different signal outputs that required, you know, banks of IRIG or banks of 1PPS, for example. Uh, Jim, on the range requirements, covered not only the accuracy, but he presented a wide, diverse variety of signal types that were needed to synchronized comm systems and satellite systems and range timing radar systems, a lot of different types of things that need synchronization on a, ride, on a range. And also a key point that there's a certain evolution of this technology going from serial time codes, if you will, into more uh, network-based uh, time protocol. And, and of course, again, GPS being a single point of failure, uh, you need to have a plan B, if you will, be it a different constellation or a, a holdover uh, oscillator type situation. Of course, the technology that uh, I just finished talking about essentially brings to bear, you know, the best of timing and a very accurate device uh, and merging the timing and the networking technology into a single chassis, right, to meet these types of requirements that we're seeing out there in industry. Uh, you know, the very good clock accuracy with excellent holdover with uh, the rubidium and OCXO oscillators in there uh, and the timing signals, you know, those tend to be very traditional in a sense. Um, but because of the high mix or the high fan out, that Flexport technology really adapts that, uh, those legacy style timing signals to whatever the application requirement is in a real space and cost efficient manner. And then as we look forward to, to, to network timing, uh, there's the NTP hardware time stamping, which is very good just in the standard uh, configuration. And then you can go to the security hardened NTP reflector. Uh, we did talk somewhat in the uh, conversation with uh, Jim and Scott about PTP. PTP is forthcoming in this device as well. 
And all these things sort of roll up, if you will, into the security, the accuracy, and the flexibility that's needed in the devices to provide these mission-critical timing signals in general. So with that, actually, it kind of brings me to the, the end of what we wanted to present here. I think we're pretty much on time. If we can go to uh, the next slide, I believe, is, uh, is the question slide. I appreciate your time and attention up to this point, and I, I think I hand it back to Alan to you for uh, managing questions, yes? Yeah, that's right. Thanks very much, Paul. Very comprehensive presentation. We have had some questions uh, come in, uh, some pre-submitted uh, before the webinar, and I'll turn to those now. First question, someone wants to know, would like to know, is there a way to reconcile the leap time between UTC, uh, uh, coordinated universal time, and GPS time? Paul, you want to address that one? Yeah, so uh, it's an interesting question. Um, Essentially, what we get from GPS is monotonic time. GPS time does not have a leap events in it, and so uh, we receive information uh, down from the satellites that there, you know, leap events and information how to adjust to UTC uh, is all is all part of what's made available. Now, generally speaking, these products uh, operate on UTC because NTP, for example, by definition is UTC. Uh, in in the 650, though, however. Uh, there is an option to disable that and just go with GPS time alone, and that way it's monotonic. You don't have to accommodate for any sort of leap second adjustments. And if you are operating in a closed network where you're not interfacing with any other NTP servers, for example, that are leap second aware, you can actually run a network uh, without having any leap adjustments provided you're satisfied with a monotonic time, but then it doesn't exactly align to UTC. But otherwise, for the most part, uh, from GPS, we, we get all the information we need to make the appropriate uh, leap second adjustments to UTC. All right, thank you. Here's, a, here's another question that I swear it comes up in every webinar, no matter what the topic of the webinar is. Uh, multi-constellations will play into it somehow. Well, that's natural. We live in a, we are starting to live in a multi-constellation environment. So in, in the aspect of timing, uh, how, how does the multiplication of constellations, the addition of constellations, uh, GNSS constellations, GLONASS, Galileo, Beidou, uh, how does that play into the provision of timing, and do you have multi-constellation support? Yeah, so I, I agree. It does come up quite frequently, especially as more countries put up uh, GNSS satellites, right? So in uh, in the product that we showed there, that in the Sync Server S600 series, uh, the GPS receiver in there does support multi constellations. Uh, at the moment, it's GPS, but we're in the process of uh, qualifying the uh, GLONASS and Beidou and satellite-based augmentation systems uh, as well. And so, uh, essentially, the receiver and, and, and many modern receivers these days, they, they take advantage of everything that's up there. When we look at product roadmaps going ahead, you know, I'll just perhaps circumvent some of the questions I, I imagine people might be thinking right now. And, you know, support for Galileo and support for new satellite signals, like uh, things like M-Code, for example. Um, as these receivers come out and become commercially available, we incorporate the technology into our clocks to take full advantage of them. Now, when it comes to timing accuracy, uh, there's not huge improvements. The main thing is really sort of a redundancy and reliability aspect. If, uh, you know, one constellation becomes unavailable or you choose not to use it, right? Uh, there's users all over around the world, and some prefer to use some constellations over the other. Uh, they're given the choice and a flexibility to use those constellations of choice. So, yeah, I, I'd venture to say... Uh, in, in terms of GNSS technology, the answer is yes. Multi-constellation support is definitely uh, here to stay. Thanks. We have a third question. What steps, and, and this gets rather specific, what steps are being taken to comply with Public Law 111.383 concerning employment of M-Code? And, Paul, you might have to give people a little bit of background in that before you answer. Wow, that's a kind of a tricky one. I can't say I'm specifically uh, familiar with that public law. 
Um, but M code is one of the new signals that uh, the GP that I guess you could say the the Air Force is putting into the GPS satellites. It's forthcoming. It's very well defined. And I believe at this point in time, uh, Alan, and you're, you're probably familiar with this too, because I'm sure it's a topic that gets talked about frequently in, in GPS world. I, I read some things on it myself, I believe, that uh, with the M code, the forthcoming GPS receivers uh, that we're expecting to be commercially available will be supporting it. And then as they become available, we'll um, begin to incorporate it in our timing products as well. Um, it's just kind of a natural evolution going forward, supporting those signals that are available. All right. So the basically the the answer is that if there's a signal, you're going to support it. If there's a publicly available signal, you're going to support it. Yes, that would be our intent for sure. Perfect. Well, thanks very much. We've we've reached the end of our presentation, and we have fielded uh, a number of questions. This webinar will be posted live to the GPS World website in another day or two. So if you'd like to re-listen to some of the content, and some of it was quite uh, complex and, uh, and, and co content rich, I should say, it will be available. And if you'd like to refer any colleagues to the webinar, it will be available to them as well. All they have to do is go to the gpsworld.com slash webinar page, and there will be a list of the recent webinars we've presented all available for download, and that includes all the slides as well as the audio track. I'd like to thank all our speakers today and thank Microsemi for bringing us this valuable webinar. I'll turn it back to our producer, Joelle. Uh, like Alan said, thank you everyone for attending and thank you to Microsemi. Um, a recording of this webinar will be posted on uh, gpsworld.com slash webinars and will also be emailed to you tomorrow. Um, if you're interested in any upcoming webinars from GPS World, uh, you can visit that same webinars page. Thank you for attending. <laughs>